right, looks like we are live. Welcome everybody to Standing for Truth. My name is Donnie and looks like we've got a, a Kung Fu versus uh, boxing uh, match tonight between Dr. Kent, the science gent, and Fox official. Now what we are debating, boxing style clearly, is going to be evolution on trial or the very specific question, is there reasonable evidence for evolution. Now, before we get into the debate itself, firstly, I want to point out that this is a continuation in the 2022 to 2023 Evolution Debate Challenge series. And so, Fox Official, I do want to thank you for uh, being here and also just being willing to engage in this important topic. So why don't we kind of break the ice a little bit before uh, the showdown begins. Fox, let's start with you. Just a real brief intro, yeah. a little bit about yourself and also a little bit about your channel. Hey guys, I'm back. Um, it's been a long time. Um, I did respond to Kent's last video um, a while back um, after the last debate. And, um, you know, I'm excited to be back. Um, my name is Fox. I have a channel called Fox Official where I just do all kinds of different things. Um, and um, I'm gonna, you know, debate evolution today. Um, I'm a wildlife biology and entomology major at Oklahoma State University, and I'm here to just have fun. So let's get into it. Okay, I like it. I appreciate it. Yes, let's have some fun. These uh, <laughs> these debates on this topic are always a blast. So Kent, good to have you back as well, brother. How you been? A little bit about yourself for that one random person in this world who doesn't know who you are, <laughs> and a little bit about uh, Dinosaur Adventureland. Well, it's good to be here. My name is Kent Hovind. I've been a Baptist preacher 48 years. I taught high school science and math for 15 years. I defend the position that the Bible is absolutely true. God made everything in six days, about 6,000 years ago. The earth is not billions of years old. Evolution is the biggest lie in the history of the world. There is no evidence at all of any animal or insect or plant ever producing offspring other than its same kind, which is what the Bible said would happen. So I defend the Bible as being true, and we have a science center and a museum and stuff in Lenox, Alabama, straight north of Pensacola, uh, 70 miles. You can come on down and see our place, Dinosaur Adventureland. Someone gave us 140 acres here to build our Christian camp. We think God ought to get the glory for his creation. Hundreds of cool science lessons and spiritual lessons and cabins you can stay in, 16 lakes and stuff to fish in. It's a blast. Come on down. Fox, you're welcome anytime. Okay. Okay, Dr. Dino, I appreciate it. The links to both debaters' uh, channels Kent and Fox are in the description box. So if you like what you're hearing from tonight's debaters, please do make sure to uh, check out their links in the description box. So what we're going to be doing tonight is, is, as we have been doing for the most part in this series, is more of a free-flowing debate. So one could say it's more informal. How we are going to uh, kick it off is with one argument at a time. Fox official is going to take up to five minutes to present point or argument number one. And then we'll give uh, Kent up to five minutes to respond. Then we'll have about a five to 10 minute back and forth, free flowing kind of discussion on that specific point. Then we'll move on to point two, then point three, and so on and so forth. So Fox, we're gonna hand it over to you for the first five minute round. Fox, whenever you're ready. And if you needed to screen share or anything like that, let me know. Yeah, and I'm gonna can... go ahead and screen share. Do I press the present button, right? Yes, yeah, okay. present and then right down to share screen. Okay, entire screen, okay, share screen. There we go, cool. Perfect. All right, let's see here, all right. So kind of what I uh, wanted to bring up today is more of like the geology side of things since we didn't really get into geology last time. Um, I know that Kent wanted to talk more about the flood, so I think we can kind of stay on that side of like the fossil record. So I've been doing some research. Um, I did a little bit of research into the Grand Canyon um, and how it was formed. Also, I'll link uh, the History Channel's episode for you guys um, in the description. I watched an excellent documentary. Um, that you should totally watch. I know it's a little bit on the old side, but I will definitely show you guys real quick. It's in my history right here. Um, so yeah, definitely go check that out on your own time. 
Um, and yeah, I'm just going to explain a little bit of how it was actually formed. So it started out um, billions of years ago. There used to be high mountains like the Himalayas. And then over time, they kind of eroded and flattened out almost like a giant plateau. And then over time, um, almost up to the last 5 million years, we see the Colorado River connected to a giant lake that poured out and carved the entire um, Grand Canyon. And if, if you even look up Earth, the Grand Canyon, you can clearly a tell. A unique planet. Restless. Oh, yeah. Sorry. And, and, and I'm, I'm going to pause your timer, too, there. It doesn't look like you're going to uh, play any more of the video, but unfortunately, no, we had the I issue. Mean, Last week, we had somebody play a history video, and oh. then the video got blocked. So we definitely oh want to be careful with that. Yeah, history channel is pretty strict. So yeah, um, let me look word. it up on the map for you guys so I can show you. So you can clearly see that it was like carved out by a river. Let me see if I can zoom in. Let me see. I need to like a good photo. Let me see. Find a good photo for you guys. It definitely looks like a giant riverbed that it was carved out in. Um, so yeah, if you look at the way it was formed, it definitely looks like a giant river that flowed into it. Um, and yeah, here's a better picture. Um, so you can literally see where the Colorado River carved into it. Um, over time, there used to be, like I said, there was a lake about 5 million years ago. Um, it was called, let me look it up real quick. I already have it on my phone. It was called the Bidahochi formation, and it was in the Pliocene to late Neogene period, um, which is the lake that was, it was larger than Lake Superior, and it flowed into um, the Grand Canyon, and it flowed very quickly when it um, eroded what used to be the flat plateau. It created the Grand Canyon, and um, it goes all the way from the Rockies to Arizona, so it just literally goes down and down and down, and it just carved out that steep canyon that you don't see anywhere else in the United States because nowhere else do we have that much water that, you know, created a formation like this. Yeah, this one's perfect. The USGS. Um, let me make that bigger for you guys. By the way, the USGS is excellent. You know, I'm just going to click on the picture and do that. So yeah, if you guys go to the USGS uh, website, look how good that is. Like you can literally see how there used to be a giant lake here and it formed and flowed through the entire canyon. Also, I want to bring up for you guys that um, they did find fossils um, in the lake that showed little shellfish and clams that used to be in the freshwater lake. Also, way before the canyon was ever formed, there used to be ocean. Um, there was uh, the sea level used to be much higher um, before the canyon was formed. And there are lots of fossils of marine life that used to live there before the Grand Canyon was ever um, formed. So yeah, there was an ocean that covered Arizona at some point in multiple points in the past. Um, the earth is continually changing um, over millions of years. You see different um, land rise and fall with the tectonic plates shifting, you know? So um, Arizona has changed a lot over time. So that's just a little bit for you guys, but uh, there's pretty much just a very small part of what I wanted to talk about. Okay, great timing. Uh, just in and around five minutes. So there's mm -hmm. argument number one. Let's hand it over to <clears throat> Kent now. Kent, whenever you're ready, uh, we'll give you up to five minutes to respond. Go ahead. All right. Well, thank you so much. Uh, Grand Canyon, one of my favorite topics. Been there many times. Love studying that thing. Great big hole in the ground. 50 foot wide river at the bottom of an 18 mile wide canyon. That river did not make that canyon, okay? Grand Canyon is quite an interesting study. It's real evidence of the probably formed 50 years after Noah's flood. After the flood, all the uh, inland depressions would be filled with water and eventually some of them are gonna get too full go over the top. Textbooks all say Grand Canyon formed over millions of years. Now, wait a minute. It's a fact Grand Canyon exists. The evolutionists have an interpretation of that in fact, and the creationists have an interpretation. Now, the fact is, the canyon exists. It's also a fact it does not talk, okay? The evolutionist says it formed slowly with a little water and lots of time. 
Creationist says, no, it formed quickly with lots of water and a little bit of time. And the evolutionists are always trying to erase this line and think their interpretation is part of the fact. No, no, Noah, it's a fact. Grand Canyon exists. It is not a fact. It took millions of years. This textbook says, the Colorado River cut through layer upon layer of rock over millions of years. This is pure propaganda. Is that a fact or an interpretation? Could there be other ways to look at this? This big dam in uh, Indiana broke, a huge dam for Purdue University. The dam went over the top, cut a gash in it, and lost all the water in 15 minutes. Once water starts moving, it picks up sand and gravel and becomes like liquid sandpaper and carves rapidly through really hard rock. So you don't, this textbook says you look back through hundreds of millions of years. This is baloney. I flew in a helicopter down to the bottom of Grand Canyon. I looked at my watch. It was the same date as when I was at the top. I didn't go back at all. Same day. Man, what happened here? Okay. So you don't look down into millions of years. You look at a big hole in the dirt. Okay. That's all you look at. Grand Canyon. If you built a dam across Grand Canyon, a huge lake would fill up behind it. Water from Wyoming drains through Grand Canyon. Okay. No question. It's a great big drainage area behind this thing. Right here is Grand Canyon right there in Arizona, part of the Kaibab Plateau. Grand Canyon is a gash across what used to be a large dam called the Kaibab Plateau. It's a big wrinkle in the mountains. The average height of this Kaibab Plateau is about seven to 8,000 feet, okay? So there's Grand Canyon. <clears throat> the snow line shows it even more clearly. Grand Canyon, uh, <clears throat> see the river enters over here and flows downhill and comes out over here. This Between these two lines is this ridge I was talking about, a natural dam formed by a wrinkle in the mountains. The river flows downhill for 277 miles. Now, the river enters the canyon at 2,800 foot elevation above sea level. It exits at 1,800 feet. The top of that ridge is seven or 8,000 feet. Now hold it. There's a schematic from the side view. The river enters over here, flows downhill. Rivers don't flow uphill. How did it start cutting the canyon? It had to be a giant lake draining. <clears throat> Rim of the canyon, 6,900 feet plus. The top of the canyon is higher than the bottom. The river only runs through the bottom. Let me know if I lose you here, okay? The top is higher than where the river enters the canyon by 4,000 feet. The top is higher than the bottom. Okay, stay with me now. <clears throat> there it is, river flowing downhill. The rivers don't flow uphill. There's no delta. Grand Canyon was formed in a week or two, not millions of years. <clears throat> we did a demonstration in Pensacola at our Dinosaur Adventure Land. We're going to build a bigger one here. This is... <clears throat> What Grand Canyon, what the lakes, if you plugged up Grand Canyon, those lakes would form again today, going clear back to Colorado. That lake got too full, and when any lake gets too full, it tops over and carves out a canyon, carves out a gash. The Monument Valley was probably formed as all the water was rushing off. Monument Valley is right there in that red circle in the middle of where the lakes would have been <clears throat> if you plugged up Grand Canyon. As the water got going over the top, it would start eroding at the other side and eat its way backwards. Dams wash out all the time. It's a common occurrence. When a dam washes out, it just cuts a gash, and the rest of the dam remains intact. This was down in Bruton, 20 miles south of us here. The dam got, lake got too full, it cut a gash, and let, let the water out. When, once the dam breaks, boy, get out of the way. I can show you thousands of pictures. The Tom Sauk Reservoir broke in 19, uh, 2005. Huge concrete reservoir, giant dam. They said, that's going to last forever. There it is, the Tom Sauk Reservoir. It got too full, went over the top carved at the other side, ate its way backwards, it ate away the spillway, and there all the water was lost in, in 10 minutes. One and a half billion gallons of water went rushing down the hillside in 10 minutes, carved out a huge canyon right below the Tom Sauk Reservoir. So I'm sorry, Mr. Fox, you are absolutely wrong. Grand Canyon is evidence of a rapid, uh, rapid erosion from a dam breaking. It probably formed in about a week, not millions of years. And it's the same date, top and bottom. There is no geologic column. Okay, go ahead. Okay, Kent, thank you for that five-minute response. Now on the topic of Grand Canyon, let's have a little bit of a back and forth. Yeah. Fox? Yeah. I definitely want to respond to his opening um, statement. Um, it actually, I have to give you some props, Kent, because you are uh, more right than you think, um, because... The lake did, uh, in fact, carve out the Grand Canyon. It flowed down very quickly and rapidly. It didn't happen over millions of years. Um, 
what did happen over millions of years was the erosion that caused the Grand Canyon to get wider and wider over time. The mud at the bottom would give way, and then the limestone over time would also give way, and the sandstone causing it to just keep getting wider and wider. Um, so, in fact, the lake did flow out five million years ago, and that rapidly caused the Grand Canyon to form. Not over millions of years, Kent. It happened very quickly. I mean, just look at how Mount St. Helens formed very quickly. Erosion can be very quick. Um, so I never said that, you know, it was going to happen over millions of years. What did happen over millions of years is the erosion from five million years ago till today to create how wide it is. So it was not as wide when it was initially formed, but today it's a lot wider. Also, I wanted to tell you that um, I go by Mrs. I am a woman. Um, so just so you could call me Mrs., that's fine. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to let you know that... Um, here, let me share my screen real quick. Actually, why don't we, uh, since since right, we're now in the, in the ten minute, time. no, that's that's okay. So uh, we appreciate those uh, points, Kent. Let's now hand it over to you for a response. Well, I'm I'm curious. Uh, I, did did they call you a boy or girl when you were born? There was something on your birth certificate. Are you really genetically? I mean, biologically. I'm, I'm genetically intersex. Yeah. I've been I've been to the doctor and they gave me all the evidence. So yeah, I think anybody in ten seconds could give you the evidence, but that's okay. <clears throat> all right. Well, Grand Canyon is indeed a washed-out dam. You are correct, but you said it took place five million years ago. This is where you're incorrect. Now you are correct that the erosion continues. It's continuing today. Grand Canyon is still eroding rock away. You can tell it's a dam break uh, if a, if a Rivers generally flow together and join at less than 90 degree angle, okay, called an acute angle. Uh, in the on Grand Canyon, on the down, down uh, river side, the rivers, the canyons join at acute angles like it happens all over the world, okay? But on the north side, they're, uh, they're uh, obtuse, greater than 90 degrees. This is an indication the lake is draining and the water is running backwards off the dam, hits the channel, turns around, and comes back out. So these barbed canyons, as they're called, are all on the north side of Grand Canyon. So it's absolutely correct. This was a dam breaking and a lake draining. Now, if this happened 50 years after Noah's flood, then the crust of the earth would only be dried out maybe 100 feet thick. I don't know how thick it dried out in 100 years or 200 years. Once it breaks through that crust and gets to the soft part that still isn't, isn't uh, consolidated yet or congealed, then erosion is rapid. It goes roaring through there. So once you get through the crust on the cake and gets into the soft cake, boy, it would do tremendous damage in, in hours. Uh, the rocks tell us a story, all right? They were formed rapidly. They're all flat layers like pancakes, no erosion marks in between them. All these layers formed in one year, Noah's flood, and then they were all washed out in probably one week. So one of the lies in the textbooks is that the Grand Canyon is, uh, took millions of years. That river did not make that canyon. The river just flows through the canyon left over from the lake draining. So you are correct. There was a giant lake behind it. Let me back up here. I don't think anybody who studies it would disagree. This was a giant lake draining. And if you plugged it up today, those lakes would form again, back to Colorado and New Mexico. So if you get that much water going through one slot, you're gonna carve out a canyon in days. It doesn't take, and, and it wouldn't, where did you come up with this 5 million years ago number? That's when it was formed, yeah. It literally shows the geologist actually took the rocks from where the lake used to be and they dated it back to about five to six million years ago. So that's when it initially carved out the canyon. How on earth do you date a rock to five? The geologist dated a rock to five million years ago. And how did they do that? Yeah, they did uh, radiocarbon dating just like they would anything else. But these rocks are sedimentary rocks. They don't contain any uh, uranium or lead or uh, potassium or argon or carbon-14. How would they date a rock that doesn't contain those things? And even then, when you're going to use any of those dating methods, you have obvious assumptions built in. How much was in it when it got laid down? How much of this material? Has the de decay rate remained constant? Has there been no contamination? In an honest court of law, none of the radioactive dates would hold up as evidence. None. There are too many. A, a freshman lawyer could defeat every one of them in a debate. Uh, so I think you're, you're correct that the Grand Canyon formed quickly. I'm glad to see some evolution is finally coming around to admit that. Now you got to get rid of the five million years ago part and you'll become a young earth creationist. Go ahead. Well, I also agree that uh, erosion is still happening today in the Grand Canyon. 
like I said, since it was initially formed to today, there's still erosion happening. You know, it's still raining um, in the Grand Canyon. So, I mean, obviously they still see erosion till today. So, Right. But that little river is only 50 feet wide, you know, from here to that window. So, and it's not flowing very fast. It very little erosion in the Grand Canyon today. When it first, when, when the lake first drained, it was rapid erosion for several reasons. This would have been about 4,000 years ago, right after Noah's flood. And <clears throat> the ground was still soft under a crust. Today, the crust is thickening. Uh, now it's about eight or 10 miles thick of dry, you know, hard rock. But if, it was, if, if the Bible theory is true, all, that, all those sedimentary layers were soft at one time. I think everybody would agree with that. All the sedimentary layers were, layers were soft. So it seems then, like we just disagree on the dating. That's about it, honestly. <clears throat> Well, could you prove that I'm wrong, that it happened, could, could, we, could it have happened you know, 4,000 years ago? How would you prove that wrong? If you find there's, a rock- There's no evidence to prove that it happened 4,000 years ago. Well, there's no evidence either way. There's no evidence it happened 5 million years ago either. So why do we all have to pay for your religion to be taught in the schools? Neither can be proven scientifically. Science is what we can observe, study, test, and demonstrate. We can demonstrate dams can erode fast. We can de it's been demonstrated accidentally many times down through history. Somebody builds a dam, oops, lost it, okay? Happens all the time. Teton Dam failed, 1976. Lost a bunch of water in a few hours. Great uh, Teton Dam failure, 1976 in Idaho. So dams wash out all the time. That's not the question. We yeah, see I don't them. disagree. We, we, we can right. see, you know, fast erosion happening. Um, like I said before, you know, the Grand Canyon was formed very rapidly. Um, and obviously the eruption or sorry, the um, erosion, you know, has slowed down a lot today. You don't see it anywhere near the amount of the initial erosion that happened from the lake. So today it's just mainly a giant chasm, you know, that we just go to look at, you know, for vacations and stuff. But you can clearly see how it was formed about 5 million well, years ago. They have all the rocks that they analyzed and carbon dated. And they also had, you know, shells from the lake and all those organisms that were in the lake that they carbon dated and everything proves that it was five to 6 million years ago, Kent. Well, I agree Grand Canyon exists. I agree there's a little bitty river flowing through the bottom of it. I do not agree it's 5 million years ago. I think you'd have a very hard time proving that to anybody. Uh, you can believe that if you wish. But the textbooks will say it, it formed slowly over billions of years, or it formed, you know, uh, millions of years ago. This uh, dam washed out in Indiana. It took a matter of 15 minutes to lose all the water. It happens quickly. So you, you're, you're, I, I'm, I have to disagree. I don't think you could prove it was 5 million years ago. The fact that there are seashells found in these different layers is evidence clearly. It wasn't in the layers, though. It was in the, the actual top, like in the sand right. and stuff like they found actual shells in the in the you know sand in the area where the lake bed was so it wasn't in the lower layers they do find organisms that were in the lower layers from the older periods like you know billions and millions of years ago like the before the grand canyon was was ever formed they have those organisms that lived before the grand canyon was formed and they have them the ones that died right before it was formed. And that's what I'm talking about is the shells that they found um, near what, right where the lake is. What happened five million years ago. You are assuming that evolution is true and certain shells are older than other shells. You start off with the assumption evolution is true and these, these uh, organisms can be prograded from you know clams up to humans. There, you start with that assumption and then you look at all the evidence in terms of that assumption. Well, I if I clamped. take your position, Kent, it's the same thing. Uh, I if agree. I assume I agree. the Bible is true, then I assume that young earth creationism <laughs> is true and that it happened 4,000 years ago. Correct. Both of us are have a belief system, but the difference is we're all paying for your religion to be taught. Why don't you guys start a private school and go teach evolution to people that want to pay and come learn it? Why the do difference you is we have people? actual evidence for our position. You don't. Okay. Part, tech, uh, your next point, you, Grand Canyon, I agree it exists. I think it formed in less than a week, and I think it was 4,500 years ago, not millions of years ago. We, we, neither of us were there, so we can, we can argue about that for the rest of the night if you'd like. Do you mind if I um, show you um, some stuff on here real quick? Um, is that okay, Donnie? 
Yes, I, I just wanted to uh, let you know, Kent and Fox, that's about 10 minutes of back and forth on argument one. Mm -hmm. And so let's either move to argument two or if, yeah. if what you were going to, okay, yeah, let, let's do that, Fox. Yeah, I'm just going to present real quick. I wanted to sure. share some um, actual decent articles. That... Okay, so, we'll, so if we're going on to argument two now, Fox, we'll mm -hmm. give you five minutes now Perfect. to... Uh, Okay, perfect. As you're pulling that up, I'll let the audience know that as always with these debates, we're going to have an audience Q&A. This is where we get you guys involved. And so I've already got several questions saved. Just make I sure. I can't wait to answer me. some questions. I love it. it. It's going to be fun. We've already got Bring a couple. Bring them on. I'm trying to convince you guys. Uh, you know, that's my job here. You know, that's I'm true. To that's true. Evolution's on trial. So, Okay, here we go. Argument number two for the night. Uh, Fox, you got five minutes. Go ahead. All right. So I went to National Geographic. Now, this is not like a scholarly article. I mean, it's still decent enough. I, I like National Geographic. It's not, you know, peer reviewed. Um, we can go into peer reviewed stuff if we need to. Um, but I'm just going to kind of show you guys a little bit of how everything was formed. In fact, let me, I think I had another article up to, is it this one? Yeah, I think so. Okay, so like I was talking about before, the mountains that were like the Himalayas, um, it was 1.72 billion years ago. They were called the Vishnu Mountains. Let me see if I can zoom in for you guys a little bit. There you go. That's a little too much. Okay, and then about 1.25 billion years ago, over that small period of time, that was about less than 0.5 billion years, so less than half a million years, the erosion caused the mountains to go into a flat plateau like I was talking about. So um, basement rocks formed deep below the Vishnu Mountains, and then the erosion leveled the mountains, creating a flat surface on which the new rocks, um, the new rock layers um, could be laid down. And then just a lot of, over a lot of, you know, time, um, Clearly here you can see 500 million years ago, after the initial um, erosion, the sea level rose during the Cambrian period. And you can see the Grand Canyon uh, supergroup underneath right there. Um, and then here's some just kind of explanation of, uh, let me go zoom out for you guys. This is um, kind of the rock types that are um, under the Grand Canyon. You can see where everything was formed. So here's the Vishnu rocks that used to be um, 1.72 billion years ago. Then you can see the Grand Canyon supergroup that was formed during the Cambrian period. Then you can see um, the Tonto group and then the Paleozoic at the top. So it shows you each time period um, where everything just changed. Um, so more than 1 million years ago, the plateau rises, the river runs through it. So this was 60 million years ago as What's the word? Um, approximately. Um, so it shows colliding tectonic plates pushed the Colorado Plateau higher in elevation. And the Colorado River carved down through the plateau, exposing ancient layers of rock. So indeed, from the lake that was formed, it um, it connected to the Colorado River. And it um, the Colorado River flowed down really quickly and formed the um, <laughs> Grand Canyon. Um, and about... This kind of goes into the human history of uh, the Grand Canyon. We don't need to really get into that too much. Um, here's a graph that shows the Colorado River um, water levels right here. Um, and I'll link this in the description if you guys want to know more. But this is just like a basic understanding of how um, over time, like over the, you know, 1.72 billion years ago to now. So from the original Vishnu Mountains to now, um, a lot has changed. It started out as mountains, went to like a plain, plat a plateau, like a flat plateau with um, some plains. And then the sea level rose on and off during the Cambrian period in periods leading up to uh, where that lake was formed. And then the lake carved out the Grand Canyon. And then that's where we are today. So there's a lot of history behind the Grand Canyon. It's very complicated. And um, honestly, um, it's one of the most interesting um, places in the United States. Um, it's just so cool that you can see how the lake, you know, from the Rockies and the other states flowed into 
northern Arizona, northwestern Arizona. It's just amazing, honestly. Um, and, you know, there was a lot of different tectonic plate shifts um, through those periods. So, you know, the different shifts around the Earth caused plates to get closer or further apart. And um, there was just a lot of different tectonic things happening. And there was a lot of different erosion over the time periods. All right, I'm going to go ahead and stop there for you guys. Okay, thank you, Fox. Again, great timing. Uh, we'll hand it over to Kent now for equal time. Let's say up to five minutes for a response, and we'll have a little back and forth. Kent, go ahead. Well, his argument number two sounds a whole lot like argument number one. He's still on Grand Canyon. I thought there was I thought there was more arguments for evolution. And you are stuck, absolutely stuck, on the idea that the layers are different ages. If the top layer is younger than the bottom layer, could you please tell me where this layer is coming from? Are they coming from outer space? Are layers being added to the Earth? How can the top layer be a different age? All the layers were formed in one year. They're all the same age. If you shuffle a deck of cards, is the top card younger? No, they're all the same age. Shuffling the layers, moving it from here to here, doesn't change the age of it. I don't know how you guys cannot see how dumb this geologic column is. It doesn't exist. There's no such thing as a Jurassic and Triassic and Mississippi. And there's no such thing. Uh, we see dams wash out. I believe San Francisco Bay is a washed out dam. There's a mountain range in Southern California and a mountain range in Northern California and a gap in the middle. If you plugged up that gap, that would take a lot of dirt, but a big lake would fill up in the middle of California today. I think it filled up maybe too full and uh, after Noah's flood, 50 years, went over the top, washed out San Francisco Bay. El Paso is another example. Why do they call it El Paso? It's the pass through the mountains. Mountain range north, mountain range south of it, and a pass through the middle where the water went pouring through. So this stuff happens on a grand scale, uh, and a big lake would fill, if you filled up the gap in El Paso there, built a dam, you could get a giant lake behind it right now today. So I think the evidence is overwhelming for rapid erosion. The Bible says in the end of time, the scoffers would be willingly ignorant of the creation and the flood. Second Peter chapter three. These little mesas, which you see all over Arizona and New Mexico, we have thousands and probably tens of thousands of them here on Dinosaur Adventure Land. Mesas are very common. There, uh, there's a city called Mesa, Arizona. The three sisters are famous uh, buttes. Here's one of the layers. A Grand Canyon, that was the Edenville Dam, when it collapsed in, uh, 2000, in 2020, that was the lake before. It lost 21 billion gallons of water in one hour. One hour. There's the lake on the right. What it used to look like on the left is what it looked like an hour later. All that was gone. Dams collapse all the time. The, the point is, Grand Canyon is a collapsed dam. I'm glad you guys are finally admitting that, or a washed out dam. Now you're still wrong about it taking about it happening five million years ago. There's no, there's no possible way you can prove that to, to anybody. Dating a clamshell you found on either side of the canyon is not gonna prove anything for when the canyon washed out. Somebody could have dropped the clamshell there 50 years ago or 200 years ago. You don't know that. 21 billion gallons of water lost it's just a matter of how you want to look at it, okay? You look at it and see a six, I look at it and see a nine. So I think we're, we're stuck on that one, Grand Canyon. I'd love to hear any other evidence you have for evolution, uh, but I would also like to hear how you can explain, how you can tell me that you know the layers are different ages. Where is this top, top layer coming from? Randall, my computer's doing funny things. There we go. The, my position is the geologic column was invented in 1830. It does not exist anywhere in the world except the textbooks. There's no way to prove. How, how could the layer above be younger? Where was it sitting around for 15 million years waiting to come down and land on the Earth? Where was it? Outer space? You guys never have answered that. How, how can the layers be different ages? But your whole argument that you just gave about Grand Canyon is based on the idea that the layers are different ages. And there's the problem. My hyperlink is not working for this one, so it'll take me a second to find it. I got a minute left here, though. So my position is there is no geologic column. It doesn't exist. You guys made it up. It's baloney. Uh, you okay, Randall? Oh, okay. Uh, and not only canyons form quickly, the layers form quickly. All over the world, we have petrified trees. No, my hyperlink isn't working. That's fine. Okay. We have petrified trees that are standing up, running through all the layers. You guys claim the layers are different ages. How do you get a petrified tree standing up, running through all of them? There, I got you get that real quickly in my last 43 seconds here. 
polystrata fossils, petrified trees in the standing position connecting all these layers. And yet you guys persist in saying, oh, those layers are different ages. This is, a kindergartner can tell you, they can't be different ages. They had to form quickly before the tree would rot. I cover this in my video number four. Polystrata fossils are found all over the world. This is not just a, a occasional thing. It happens quite frequently. Let me find some better pictures here. It's easy to prove all the layers formed in less than a year before the tree could rot. So I think you're completely mistaken about the layer. You probably were taught this in school. As I said, I'll come debate all the professors at Oklahoma State at the same time, half my brain tied behind my back. There is no geologic column. Grand Canyon is not millions of years old. The whole world's only 6,000 years old, but go ahead. All right. So I'm going to just slightly respond to that. Um, there definitely are layers, Kent. Um, you can tell from where each time period was. Um, the Earth has changed so much over each time period that um, there's just evidence through each, you know, rock column. Um, it's pretty obvious you can date each section. Um, so I'm going to kind of tie it in um, to how this works with evolution. I'm just going to um, real quick um, continue the article that actually talks about human history and uh, the Grand Canyon, and then we're going to move on to some other things I want to talk about. So as the geological story of the uh, canyon would uh, wound to an end, the human story began. Fox, People, uh, real quick, uh, mm -hmm. were you looking to share screen or, you, or were you just reading? Oh, yeah, yeah. Let me do that real quick. Sorry. And so for argument two here, I've got it down as the geologic column. So with the first two arguments being geology related, what we'll do once we move into argument shift three, is we'll shift to, to maybe biology or genetics mm -hmm. or something yeah. like that. Okay, here we All go. Right. So um, more than 10,000 years ago, the humans uh, discovered the Grand Canyon um, as the geological story of the canyon um, pretty much came to, in, to an end. The human history began, the human story began. People first arrived in the Americas at the end of the last ice age more than 12,000 years ago. Uh, by around 10,000 years ago, they were living in and around the canyon, hunting enormous, now extinct beasts such, such as the Sha Shasta Sloth. Bleh. Most recently, people living in the canyon made and left um, split twig animal figurines that have been dated to about 4,000 years ago. A thousand years ago, people were growing crops and along the canyon bottom and stashing their harvests in shelters hollowed from the walls, some still visible today. Here's the little figurines. Um, and this happened way after um, the canyon was formed, obviously. Um, and 100 years ago, this is just basically today, there are 12 Native American tribes who live in near the canyon, but their lives are dramatically different from their times in the past. Um, so today is pretty much just a tourism hotspot, but earlier in human history, um, there were Native Americans that lived around the area, and uh, their whole lives revolved around the Colorado River and in the canyon. Um, so let's move a little bit on to some different points I want to bring up. Um, I know Kent brought up uh, the lake that was in California. There actually used to be a giant lake in California um, that was larger than any of the big um, lakes that we have in the United States today. And then over time, um, the United States just... Um, completely abused the agriculture um, and it dried up because they were using the water for agriculture. Um, so unfortunately, over time, um, this is actually evidence that humans can destroy um, the ecosystem and climate change um, is somewhat related, but it was mostly humans because we used our own water that we had and used it for agriculture and we completely lost the huge lake that used to be there. Um, and if that lake was to drain into, say, some kind of, if it was higher elevation, it would have been like the Grand Canyon. It would have formed a similar canyon. So it would have been similar. Um, but yeah, unfortunately, it's gone now because of humans. Um, there's actually a great video you guys should watch um, by the infographic show. I'll link it later. Um, but I wanted to talk more about... Um, Definitely the um, how the continents have shifted over. Okay, Fox, why don't we start there since we are in the or stop there since we are in the uh, free flowing aspect of argument two. And then let's just do our best for the audience sake because there are okay. some questions coming in from the audience to uh, as we're making the arguments, let's circle them back to uh, how they support evolution, uh, basically. So I appreciate that, Fox. Uh, Kent, let's give you an opportunity to respond however you feel necessary. 
Well, the whole argument tonight has been about the geologic column and the Grand Canyon. None of that would really have anything to do with evolution. You don't see any animal ever changing into a different kind of animal. The Bible says the scoffers in the last days would be willingly ignorant of the creation and the flood. They don't want to admit God created the world, and they don't want to admit there was a flood that over, the earth was overflowed with water. And they sure don't want to admit there's a coming judgment of God. And there is, Mr. or Ms., whatever you are, Fox, another a judgment coming. You're going to be judged by the very God you may or may not believe in. Uh, so there was a flood and a coming judgment. Grand Canyon is carved out in a few, probably a few days, not millions. The textbooks say it took millions of years. That's baloney. So all of this, if the earth is billions of years old, and if Grand Canyon formed five million years ago, where's the evidence for evolution? Have we ever, has anybody ever seen, you're studying entomology, has anybody ever seen any creature have babies that were considered a different kind than the parents? Do you believe you're related to a walking stick, for instance? If so, where's the evidence for this? The charts would show you're related to a walking stick. I say, that's not science. That's religion. And you're welcome to it. Oh, let's see. I've got too many things going at once. Here we go. Uh, anyway, that's all I wanted to say is that so far I haven't seen any evidence for evolution. Go, go ahead. If you don't mind, I'm going to um, go ahead and finish this part and then we'll tie it in for you guys. All right. Um, so pretty much um, in geologic terms, a plate is a large rigid slab of solid rock. So this actually really ties into evolution because you can see throughout all the periods of time how the earth changed with the plate tectonics and the animals also changed based on where they would relocate to. Um, so the word tectonics comes from the Greek root. Greek word root to build. I'm not going to read all this, but clearly you guys can see that there used to be Pangaea around 250 million years ago during the Permian. Then during the Triassic, you could see them start to break up a little bit. About 200 million years ago during the Jurassic, you could see it them, you know, basically drifting apart from each other um, during the Jurassic period. Um, in the Cretaceous, it looks pretty similar to what we have today. And then, yeah, now we have present day where they completely drifted apart. And they move, you know, every year the continents move by just a tiny bit. I don't remember the exact measurements, but over time, you know, the continents are going to keep forming to different um, gigantic um, continents. So, you know, in the future, um, in the future, millions of years, you know, in the future, we're going to see um, the continents reform again and then drift apart and reform. It's it's basically a giant cycle. So throughout Earth's history, we're going to see, you know, this just keep happening where the tectonic plates shift um, and, you know, just drift apart, then come back together, drift apart. And um, that causes a lot of changes for, um, you know, species. Um, and species have to adapt and they have to learn to, um, migrate to different places because over time, you know, all the shifting in the continents is going to cause different um, weather phenomenon. And, you know, obviously that's going to cause lots of adaptations and mutations and species are going to have to learn to survive. Um, and that's just what we see throughout the past and in the present. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's just a little bit of that. Um, I just wanted to show you guys how the continents um, have changed over time, and um, I want next, the next thing after this, I'm going to show you guys um, our earliest ancestors again, and then how they... Fuck, I'll, I'll stop you there. I, I think Ken's feed dropped, oh, but okay. um, I think he was trying to reconnect the internet. There was a oh. little bit of blurriness going on with his camera, mm -hmm. so what we'll do is just hold off a little bit until he... He gets back, I guess in the meantime, I'll just go over uh, a couple announcements. Mm -hmm. So um, guys, this is the first debate in a series of about five debates in the next week. So we've got a debate marathon starting with Fox Official and Kent. Tomorrow, we've got our first podcast debate specifically on genetic entropy. It'll be myself versus Snake Was Right. So make sure you're here for that one. And then on 
Thursday, we've got Kent back. This will be an earlier debate. We're going to have Christian Dean. He's on a completely different uh, time zone. So this is going to be earlier. It's going to be at four in the afternoon. Three central. Is there good evidence for evolution? And then we've got a series of soteriology related debates. So we're going to have uh, Charles Jennings and Travis Thomas debating uh, the doctrine of salvation and also uh, John Crawford and Merritt. And looks like we've got Kent back here now. And so, okay, good to have you back, Kent. And I guess what we'll do is just kind of go from here. Uh, Kent, if there's anything you want to respond to in terms of what you heard from, from Fox, and then we'll move into something more uh, maybe biology related or uh, related to biological evolution. Kent, go ahead. Well, he mentioned that there were figurines found in the Grand Canyon area that are 4,000 years ago, and that I would agree with, okay? And that, you know, the modern man didn't get in there till what's his name, Powell or somebody did the trip down the Grand Canyon back in 1880-something. Uh, so, yes, it's, it's pretty recent as far as uh, publicity about that canyon. But the further you go back in time, the numbers become fuzzy and imaginary. You know, I can understand 3,000 years ago, 4,000 years ago, you know, um, Four billion years ago, four million years ago, those are just they, your, the brain fades out when you try to imagine those big numbers, and it's, it's there's no need for them. If the flood was 4,400 years ago and Grand Canyon formed 50 years after that flood, it would cut through the crust that had dried, however thick, however, however much had dried. Pick a number: 50 feet, 100 feet. Once it gets through the crust, it gets into the soft part. Erosion is enormous, and the canyon formed in less than a week, and Today, it's all hard rock, but I bet if you dig in far enough, even drill into the sides, you went in a mile or two, it probably still got soft rock back in there. It still hasn't dried out all the way down, all the way through. So anyway, enough on Grand Canyon. I'm still hoping to see some evidence for evolution. What do you mean by that word evolution? Go ahead. Oh, all right. You're I'm good now, Fox. You're good. Yeah. Okay, cool. So, yeah, like I was talking about before, um, well, Kent kind of went off, but um, I was just showing how the plates have shifted over time and, you know, throughout the history of each period, you could see that animals had to um, adapt and evolve over time um, to fit the changing environments caused by the tectonic plates shifting. And uh, we continue to see that today as you know, the plates shift apart. Um, you know, there's just so many changes in the climate and with the climate changing rapidly, um, species have to adapt. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and share um, some more of my presentation. I didn't get to finish last time. I don't remember where I left off. So I'll just kind of briefly go over, over each topic. Okay, so what we'll do, um, Fox, is I'll start mm -hmm. the timer again for five minutes okay. as we move into argument number three. Mm -hmm. For the night. So argument one was the Grand Canyon. Argument yep. two will say was the geologic column. Now we're into argument number three. So here we go. All Fox, right. floor is yours. I'm not going to spend too much time on this because we already went over this, but um, a species is a group of similar living things that ranks below the genus in scientific classification and is made up of individuals able to produce offspring with one another. The one humped camel is a different species from the two humped camel and a class of things of the same kind within the same name, kind, sort. Those are synonyms basically for species, but what science uses is species. Um, and then speciation is the formation of new and disti distinct species in the course of evolution. How old is the earth and the universe? We already went over this last time. The earth is about 4.543 billion years old. Milky Way galaxy is about 13.61 billion years old, and the universe is approximately 13.7. Um, the sun is about 4.6 uh, million years old, so just slightly older than the Earth. Here's a good example of speciation. We already went over um, the allopatric, parapatric, um, parapatric, and um, sim <laughs> sympatric. Um, and this just shows the different types of speciation. Um, the Galapagos finches are an excellent example of that. Um, and to this day, actually, there's been some people that went out there recently, and they have found that there are some new finches that are showing up because there are hybrids being made. And each species 
has a different um, adaptation for smaller beaks and larger beaks, depending on what they're eating, smaller seeds, larger seeds. Um, but they have discovered some new species down there, and, and it's really interesting. I definitely recommend you guys go check that out. Um, and that is, you know, speciation. Um, it is not micro it's not microevolution, it is speciation. So I know people get that mixed up all the time. Microevolution is totally different than that. Um, evolution is the change in characteristics of a species over several generations and relies on the process of natural selection. Um, if you guys don't know about genetic drift, founder's effect, bottleneck, and all that stuff, I'm not going to go over in detail for you guys because it's kind of advanced. Um, don't really need to go over genotype and phenotype, I feel like. Um, taxonomy is really important. So you have kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. That's how we characterize and that's how we, um, clap. That's how we, you know, put everything into, um, different classes and it's, it's the classification of organisms. That's how we put organisms in their own, you know, different areas. Um, so, you know, humans are in kingdom on Amalia, and then you could just go down to see where we are. Um, we're in Homo sapiens. So yeah, like I said, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. Um, taxonomy is the scientific study of naming, defining, and classifying groups of biological organisms based on their shared characteristics. So, you know, every animal um, on earth today all have common ancestors. So we're not directly related, but we all share you know, common ancestors in the past with each other. Um, so all these animals have common ancestors that go back billions of years ago, but then they started to diverge into their own groups over time. And that's how we have so many animals today is because there just have been so many different trees. So evolution is like a giant family tree where each set of organisms just keep branching off from their ancestors and it creates new species over time. So it's not like the walk of progress that you see on, um, you know, TV and stuff like that. Um, and by, you know, people who uh, misunderstand um, evolution, that's, that's, they, that's misrepresenting evolution. You know, humans didn't evolve directly, uh, you know, from one ancestor over time. We evolved from different ancestors on a giant family tree. So um, evolution is just one giant family tree, literally. Um, and these are called cladograms and phylogenetic trees. These show thirty how seconds. They all have common ancestors with each other. Um, so yeah, I, mean, I think I'll leave it off there. Um, we can continue uh, in the next part. Okay, thank you, Fox and uh, Kent. We are now going to hand it to you for five minutes. Go ahead. Okay, several things. Uh, you showed pictures of these you know, lines going back from different creatures. It showed, you know, the mammals and humans uh, related to a chicken. So, Fox, I'd like you to simply answer the question with a yes or no. Do you believe you're related to a chicken? Do you have a common ancestor with a chicken? Yes, I'm we gonna... do. Okay, yes, that's what I thought. Okay. Species has quite a few... Far, different... far enough back? Yeah, we do. Far enough back, right. Mm -hmm. uh, we, can't, we can't go back, but uh, anyway. Species... A group of organisms, similar characteristics, capable of exchanging genes or interbreeding. I agree. Okay. Uh, definition of species, type, kind, sort. Well, look at that. The Bible uses those, kind and sort, a whole bunch of times, 24 times in the first seven chapters. It says they will always bring forth after their kind, after their kind, after their kind, after their kind. There are no exceptions. What you gave with the Darwin finches on the Galapagos Islands, it's true, Darwin counted 14 different kinds of finches based on basically their beak shape because of the food supply on that island. And the grants went back there about 20 years ago on a, on a government grant and got more uh, and discovered some hybridization between these different uh, variations. They're still a finch. He didn't present it, produce anything but a finch. There are 10 varieties of crows. Might have had a common ancestor called a crow. You don't give any evidence for real evolution. They're still bringing forth after their kind. There are 72 species of herons. Might have had a common ancestor called a heron. The finches had a common ancestor called a finch. God said they'd bring forth after their kind. There are simply no exceptions to that. If you wish to believe otherwise, that's your religion. 
God said they'd bring forth after their kind, after their sort. That's all anybody's ever seen. And there's no scientific evidence whatsoever for any animal, plant, or insect bringing forth anything other than what every four-year-old would consider the same kind. So I've found so far, I think, 27 different definitions of the word species scattered throughout the uh, internet and stuff like that. What's your definition of species? Species, species, species. You can study that for yourself. So if you wish to believe you're related to a chicken, that's your business. If you wish to believe you're a woman, that's your business. But it is not science. Science where we can observe, study, and test. Where is the scientific evidence of any animal producing a different kind of offspring? You can draw lines on paper and say, oh, I'm sorry, I forgot to hit start. Donnie, never mind. You time me then. Let me know when the time runs up. I understand the classification system. We've decided to classify them, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. I taught biology. I understand it really well. The animals don't care how we classify them. They don't care one bit if we put them in the same category with another one. We turn all the animals loose in our farm out in the field. The cows look for the cows. They don't look for the pigs to mate with. Okay? The pine trees look for other pine trees. There are no exceptions. They, do, they can tell you what kind they are. If you can't figure it out, I'm sorry. But they can tell you, we've decided to classify humans and apes in the same family. The apes don't think they're part of our family. Some scientist does, oh, they're similar. The apes don't care. I tell you what, you get apes, chimpanzees, uh, 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 bonobos, orangutans, turn them all loose, they'll seek out their own kind to mate with. It's only the humans that are dumb enough to seek out to mate with an animal. Animals don't want to mate with us. Are you kidding? It's a, it's a biblical kind is what the Bible says they bring forth after their kind. There are no exceptions to that. The purpose of this whole debate series is for you guys to show evidence. You didn't show evidence. You made a declaratory statement. You said we're related. Well, that's not evidence. Where is the evidence of any animal producing something other than it's and anybody would consider the same kind? Uh, there are, oh, let's see, there we go, biological species. The rhinoceros don't, are not the least bit interested in the monkeys. Even though they live together, they don't care. They're not looking for them to mate with. So a kind or sort is the definition of species. Wow, just what the Bible says. Group of animals, individuals that can actually or potentially interbreed. I would agree. Can you actually or potentially interbreed with a chicken? You claim you're related if you go back far enough. Could you breed with one? We got a bunch here. Come try it. Go ahead, your turn. Okay, Kent, thank you so much for the response. And now we've got... Let's go with a, a, another 10 minutes or so of back and forth on this specific topic. Go ahead, Fox. This is Kent. He is uh, Dr. Strange making magic, using magic, magical thinking. Um, obviously, um, animals do not produce any other animals um, that are different from the first animal, clearly. Um, you know, you can see that with... Um, lions and tigers like they they can make a liger but it'll become infertile right um there are hybrids in certain animals but a species will stay mating in within a species um i never said that an animal will become a different animal kent um over time they will diverge and create their own new groups um because they're going to have new adaptations for whatever happens in the future they have to adapt to um, their, you know, um, ecosystem. So I'm going to go ahead and share with you guys um, a little bit more of my presentation. Okay. okay, let me show you guys. So yeah, um, phylogenetic trees. Um, is an evolutionary tree showing an estimate of phylogeny where the distance of oh, each branch... Actually, Fox, let me um, mm -hmm. stop you right there. I was just muted. Yeah. I was trying to let you know. So we, since we are in the free-flowing aspect mm -hmm. of argument three, let's allow Kent to respond to anything he'd okay. like to in terms of what you said. Have a mm -hmm. little uh, bit more of an organic conversation. Okay. And then uh, and then we'll have some time after that for, for some more slides. Kent, okay. go ahead. Well, I couldn't write fast enough to get the quote of what him saying, but I think he said it right. We, we don't see any animal or plant produce anything other than their same kind. We don't see it. Therefore, if you want to imagine it, you and SpongeBob go have a party. It's imagination. That's all evolution is, imagination. If we go back far enough, you can't go back at all, okay? Not at all. 
Many times I wished I could go back just five seconds to undo the dumb thing I just did. You can't go back in time. You can imagine what it was like, and you can imagine that your geologic column exists when it doesn't exist anywhere in the world. But you imagine you're related to a chicken. There's a lot of differences between a human and a chicken. A lot of differences. Did, where is the evidence of any animal slowly turning into either a chicken or a human? We don't see any animal today. They're still having a whole lot of babies today. None of them produce offspring other than the same kind. What you have is a vivid imagination. You have no science at all on your side. You've been going to university for years, and all they do is fill your head with mush. I'll debate all your professors at the same time. Okay. All right, let me respond real quick. Um, obviously, um, it's pretty clear that um, I agree definitely. Species don't produce anything but their species. Good. Um, but we can't observe evolution happening. We can, uh, like macro, we can't observe macro evolution happening in real time because it takes way too long, Kent. I mean, we'll, we'll all be long dead, you know, when species start, you know, adapting and becoming, you know, um, or not, well, adapting and then creating new um, species over time, like a long period of time. Um, if you actually do um, research into how whales evolved, it's very interesting. You guys should definitely check it out. They used to have, um, they had ancestors that were just like ungulates, like deer. And over time, they became more and more adapted to the water. And uh, over that time period, you know, over the millions of years, they adapted to become, you know, um, fully aquatic. Um, they lost their um, limbs and yeah, they uh, developed pectoral fins uh, to help them move through the water. So some something similar um, will happen in the future. It's called speculative evolution for the future where we just have fun, like trying to figure out where humans will evolve in the future, um, like in the next few million years where our current animals will evolve. Um, we can't we can't see it because it's way too long for us to observe, but we can speculate based off of what we have today, what the animals of tomorrow will look like. So, you know, in the next few million years, we can speculate what they'll look like. And we already have the evidence of what they used to look like in the past. So, you know, we can take what we have today and in the past and speculate what they'll look like in the future. Of course, we can't predict, you know, how the climate's going to change and how they adapt to the, ch the change in climate, but we can, you know, make predictions. Okay. Appreciate that, Fox. Kent, go ahead. Well, you're correct. We cannot observe evolution happening. The definition of science. Science is knowledge gained from using observations and experiments to describe the world around us. Science, we make an observation, we observe what happens, and we see cows always produce cows. We see dogs always produce dogs. Science would tell us evolution doesn't happen at all. You have to imagine that it happened if you give it more time. We don't see it at all. How many animals had babies today in the world, would you guess? Counting insects and, and birds and fish? Trillions. How many produced something different than their kind? None. Nobody did. The fish made baby fish. The birds made baby birds. The cows made baby cows. No exceptions. You wish to believe. You call it science. And you said whales evolved. I can't believe you're still teaching that. You need to go back and study the evolution of the whale. It didn't happen. It's imagination. They line up a bunch of animals and say, oh, well, look at this. It slowly went from a creature like a dog to a whale. And the evidence they use for this has been proven wrong 100 years ago. There's no evidence of a whale evolving. There are 14 baleen whale species, 76 species of tooth whales, and 90 whales, dolphins, and porpoises, all in the same order. They, they put them in categories. They, they tell you, and you got taught this. I'm sorry, you, you probably paid to be taught this lie. That's the sad part about it. But they're teaching that the whale has a vestigial pelvis and his legs turned into flippers, like you said, pectoral fins. This is absolute baloney. It's an anatomically impossible. They undulate up and down. Some sides with fish do side to side. They breathe, the lungs are different. The, so many things are different. There is no evidence whatsoever of any animal doing this. Just imagine whales walking around. The evidence they showed you was proven wrong years ago. They show you the whale pelvic bones right there. Look at those bones right there, boys and girls. That's the whale's pelvis. No, it's not. Those muscles, are, those bones are anchor points 
for special muscles to attach to that allow them to reproduce. It's got nothing to do with walking on land. They got to mate underwater in the dark with no arms and they can't talk and say, screw it over, honey. They got to maneuver everything with special muscles to line things up so they can make babies. This has nothing whatsoever to do with evolution. Stop teaching that whale evolution is part of science. It's a religious belief, been long disproven, and it's just not true. Watch my video number four for much more on that. Uh, the claws, the, the, the snakes have these little claws at the back. They use the same thing, special muscles, special bones that allow them to reproduce. Got nothing to do with walking on land. So I think you got taught, uh, sad, you should get your money back. Tell you what, I'll come to Oklahoma at my expense. I'll debate all your professors and you and I can go to the uh, registrar's office and say you want your money back because they lied to you. How's that? All right, let's get into, um, let me pull something up for you guys. Um, so yeah, let me um, share just something small real quick for you guys. But yeah, whale evolution is very interesting. Um, you guys should definitely look into it. Um, so this is a great example of convergent evolution where species have similar traits. Um, you can see here, um, platypi um, developed webbed feet for semi-aquatic movement. Um, same with ducks. They have similar webbed feet that they have. Um, they both evolved separately and they're not related that closely. Um, they're in totally different groups, but they have similar adaptations, just like sharks and dolphins are not that closely related, but they have similar adaptations for the water. And so did, um, if you look back in time, the ichthyosaurs looked very similar to modern day dolphins. You know why? Because that's convergent evolution. They developed similar traits, um, just like penguins and puffins. They live on totally different sides of the world, but they develop similar traits over time. Um, so yeah, like I was um, gonna mention before, um, we have homologous, the homologous structures and analogous structures. Um, and you guys could definitely see that, uh, like what Kent was talking about. Um, let me go ahead and bring something up for you guys. Um, the whales lost their legs over time. Um, they used to have hooves, and then they developed into flippers over time. And this happened over millions and millions of years, a very long time. Um, you know, these species diverged over a very long time. They all have a common ancestor. Um, let me see if I can pull that up for you guys. Okay. So yeah, um, baleen whales are gigantic. They all came from smaller ancestors. But over time, you can see here, let me zoom in for you guys. They still have, um, you know, remnants of their old legs, just like humans have their tailbones. We still have remnants of, you know, when we used to have tails. Well, same with whales. They used to have, you know, long legs used for land, but over time they didn't need the legs anymore. So they started losing them over time. So if you go to their old, their oldest ancestors that were kind of dog-like, kind of deer-like, um, they had full, you know, quadrupedal legs. And over time, as they adapted to water, they didn't need those legs anymore. Um, they started developing webbed, you know, feet and webbed toes. And then over time, they became fins because they didn't need that anymore. They adapted. And if you guys want to see a great example of, um, I'm just going to bring this up for you guys real quick. A great example. And, and Fox, I just wanted to remind you, since we're in the free flowing portion of this argument, if you want to maybe wrap it up in the next yeah. 20 seconds. Okay. Uh, the stickleback is a great um, example of microevolution today where we can actually observe um, microevolution, uh, macroevolution is on too big of a scale, but they um, changed their outer um, like scales um, over like 60 years. Um, I'll touch on that next for you guys. Okay, appreciate it. Uh, There's also the example of the mosquitoes um, that also diverged into a new species. I can bring that up for you guys as well. Okay, go ahead, Kat. I, I am, I guess, baffled at how thoroughly they brainwashed you into believing this stuff. You are completely brainwashed. I mean, like, unbelievable. Hey, we'll try to fix it, okay? Come visit Dinosaur Adventure Land, we'll fix it. First place, the tailbone is not vestigial. If you believe the tailbone is vestigial, I will pay to have yours removed. I'll remove it myself. I know right where it's at. I taught anatomy. The coccyx, 
has no present function. No, it's, it's absolute baloney. They're still teaching this. It's been known for centuries, well, for decades. That there are nine muscles that attach to the tailbone that are essential for all sorts of things. Reproduction, defecation, posture, etc. Nothing to do. It's a lie. Been proven wrong a long time ago. There are no vestigial structures. The whale does not have a vestigial pelvis. You don't have a vestigial tailbone. But even if there were, that's the opposite of evolution. Where is the example of anybody gaining anything? It just doesn't happen. You kept using words like they adapted, they developed. This is propaganda. This is imagination. Where is the scientific evidence? We don't see any. I'd like to adapt a third or develop a third arm so I could drive and hold the can of Coke at the same time. We, you know, this whole idea, they brainwashed you into believing, well, over millions of years it developed. You've been brainwashed. I'm sorry. There's no kind way to say it. You and SpongeBob need to go have a party together, okay? You have an imagination. It's all you have. So you keep using words. And even though I showed you that the whales did not evolve, you still went right back to it. You're going right back to your script. There is no evidence of evolution. All these family trees that they put in the textbooks are just plain baloney. Tell them I said so. Like I said, I'll debate them all at the same time. There isn't any evidence for evolution. Let me get one more thought here, Beck. You believe very thoroughly that you are part of a family tree and you're related to a chicken. I believe that's what you said. These family trees show indeed the humans and the birds related. And they go back to a common ancestor. Uh, they drew a line on paper. This is not science. They got a line between that and a ladybug and a reptile and a pine tree. Drawing lines on paper isn't science. Where is the example of any animal today where we can see them produce a different kind? A mosquitoes developing a new mosquito that's now resistant to pesticide or something. Or the mosquitoes in Minnesota, I think, are 4% larger than the mosquitoes in Florida. They're still mosquitoes. They can still interbreed. We might decide to call that a new species. That's not evolution. That's man putting his classification on the animal. The animal doesn't care at all. There is no evidence at all for any animal or plant or insect. You're an entomology study student. Where's the evidence from entomology of any insect? becoming a different, what anybody would call a different kind. Man is putting, we put the classification system together, the animals don't care. Go ahead. No problem. Um, so yeah, I'll go into um, the stickleback after I respond a little bit. Um, can obviously we can trace DNA, um, deoxyribonucleic acid, and everything shares DNA. We all share DNA with each other. We're, you know, 98 to 99% related to chimpanzees. Um, and, you know, we're closely related to a lot of primates. We're all in a group of primates. Um, and if you go far back enough, the first animal that really diverged was the sponge in periphera. Um, and those evolved from some, um, I believe, prokaryotes. Um, and there's some excellent papers. I'm not going to go over it. But um, pretty much all modern species evolved from prokaryotes and eukaryotes. Over time, we see animals pop up um, and then, you know, different uh, species diverge. Um, so, yeah, sponges were probably the first, one of the first organisms that um, was on this planet about, I think, half a billion years ago, I think it was. Let me, let me I can double check for you guys. Um, it might be a, a little bit longer than that. Let me see. Okay, uh, Kent, if there's anything you wanted to respond there. We just got a few minutes left. Fox, yeah, about half. And um, oh, I'm sorry. Half, um, yeah, half a billion years. Yeah, five, um, 541 million years ago, around. Okay. So, yeah, about half a billion years ago, uh, the first animals started to appear. And over time, you know different animals had different adaptations and they became new species over time. Um, so yeah, there's all the evidence is everywhere. Kent. Um, DNA, we all share DNA with plants, you know, all animals. We all share DNA because we are all part of the same plant. We all share common ancestors with each other. Every animal goes back to a sponge. So everybody on earth shares DNA with each other. We just have, we're more closely related to certain animals than others. We're in the group of primates. We're the closest, most, most closely related to, you know, a chimpanzee. 
Okay, Fox, I'm going to stop you there just because we do got to start wrapping it up soon as we do have audience Q&A time. Uh, Ken, if you wanted to respond to the DNA similarity across the biological world argument, feel free to do so as we start to wind the conversation down. I would agree there are DNA similarities. That does not prove common ancestry. That proves common designer. Every book in my library here, how many do I have? 8,000. Every one of the books has the same code called the alphabet, 26 English letters. What does that prove? They're related? No, that's the code with which you write English, okay? The code that God chose to write in life forms, developing uh, secondary generations, etc., is DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid or ribonucleic acid. I understand how it works. I taught biology. But the fact that there are similarities does not prove common ancestry. It proves common designer. If all the animals didn't have some similarities, we could only eat each other. But God made them similar enough to where the brown cow can eat the green grass and make the white milk, and I drink it and get the blonde hair. That's amazing. That's part of a design feature. You were taught and brainwashed into believing that it's proof of evolution. No, it's not. We can't go back in time. There is no geologic column. No fossil would prove anything other than it died. You couldn't prove it had any kids, and certainly not kids that were different. All we've seen is cows produce cows, no exceptions. Anybody wants to believe other than that, believe what you want. I'm just pointing out it's not science. And I wish you guys would admit you have a religion of evolution. You don't have any science. You believe in evolution. You believe the whale lost his feet and developed flippers. Meanwhile, he can't walk or swim because they're not feet anymore and they're not flippers yet. When they're halfway, now he's really in trouble for millions of years. They all died, okay, because they couldn't walk or swim. So you don't stop and think about the wild problems this creates. I'm doing a series every Friday night on my channel, Kent Hovind Official, called Making Babies. How different creatures make babies. We did one last week or two weeks ago on the sponge. Do you believe the sponge is the ancestor of everything today? You better do some study on how the sponge makes babies. There is no similarity. The DNA similarity is only evidence for a common designer. But you're running, you're running from that designer, aren't you? You don't want him telling you what to do. I understand. Can I respond, Don? Sure. Sure, go ahead, Fox. <laughs> yeah, um, I definitely don't believe in a God. Um, there's no evidence for God. There's no evidence for a designer. What there is evidence for is evolution. Mm -hmm. And all animals share a common ancestor. Um, and I don't think you understood the whale evolution, Kent, because clearly we went from terrestrial animals to semi-aquatic to fully aquatic over time. So there wasn't a point where they couldn't, you know, swim. Like even when they were terrestrial, they could swim at, you know, a certain level, but they got more adapted for swimming over time. So over time, they started having webbed feet. And then over more time, they lost the web feet and they gained flippers. They became flippers over time. So they became more and more adapted for their environment, for the ocean. So over time, they became more adapted for aquatic life. And we're doing similar studies right now to see how uh, theropod dinosaurs, certain ones like Spinosaurus, was um, either semi-aquatic or fully aquatic based off of uh, the... I'm sorry, uh, Fox, there's a bit of uh, echo there, but okay. So what we'll do, since we do have quite a few audience questions, Fox, if you don't mind, you started the conversation. So why don't we give Kent the last word, allow uh, him to respond. I appreciate that. And then we'll get into some audience questions. So Kent, go ahead, feel free to have the last word in terms of the, the discussion portion, then okay. we'll get into some questions. Go ahead. All he gave is what anybody would consider dogma. Yes, we know they turned into whales. They're like, you better believe that, kid. It's going to be on the test. There's no evidence of this happening. It's not science. It's religious dogma. You have a great religion, a very thorough uh, pre priesthood that makes sure you believe it or you get excommunicated. I understand. But it's nothing but dogma. You don't see a, a dog turning into or a dog like animal turning into a whale. There'd be trillions of changes. And it does, we don't see it happen. Science is what we can observe, study, test. Look up the definition of science, things we know by observation. We don't observe it. You imagine going back in time, billions of years ago, that's not science. None of it is science. Okay, go ahead, Donnie. 
Do you mind if I say something real quick? Um, well, it, it might result I, I in, in further discussion. Yes, sure. Fox, if yeah. you want to say something uh, yeah. real quick, and then just we'll get close out. Um, definitely, science is observations, and what we do observe is we can see how the animals changed over time through their skeletons and through the fossil record. Uh, it's really obvious, Kent. All you have to do is look at the fossil record and see how these animals changed over time. And their skeletal features, you can literally see everything that you need to see about, you know, how they lived and how they adapted and changed over time. All right, that's my final words. Foxy, usually we do do a couple of minutes in terms of concluding statements. So if you wanted to wrap everything up right now yeah. and, and say a minute, we'll do the same for Kent. Cool. That'll allow me to organize these questions to the side awesome. and, and we'll do that. So, so let's do a minute concluding statement All uh, right. right now, Fox. And so go ahead. Mm -hmm. So yeah, make sure you guys are uh, subscribed to my YouTube channel. Um, thank you everybody for tuning in today. Um, definitely evolution is 100% true it's 100 fact um and in science the highest um scrutiny level is a theory and evolution is a theory it's not a hypothesis you know it is a theory it is the strongest form of evidence that you can have in the scientific community and we do observe evolution we observe micro evolution we observe speciation and we can also look at the fossil record and see macro evolution everything is observable Kent. we can see everything through the fossil record and through DNA and everything, uh, you know, through biology, chemistry, you know, geology, all of it comes together. We can see in all those fields of study how everything evolved and everything came together over time. So there is so much evidence for evolution. Um, it wouldn't be a theory if, you know, it hadn't passed the highest levels of scrutiny. Um, it wouldn't exist if that was not, if that wasn't the... Sorry, Siri's saying something. Um, if it wasn't the highest level of science, it wouldn't exist. You know, if uh, design was really true, you know, um, a creator was real, that would be the highest level of science. If science found that there was a God, it would be different. But no, the, the evidence doesn't support that there's a God that created everything. All right. Thank you, guys. Okay, Fox, thank you for the uh, concluding statement. Kent, we'll do the same thing. Uh, we'll give you a concluding statement, wrap up your thoughts and points, anything you wanted to uh, say without, you know, anything left hanging. We'll say two to three minutes and then we'll move on from there. So, Kat, go ahead, brother. All right. Well, thank you so much. Uh, oh, hang on. Sorry. Um, there is no such thing as a fossil record. There are fossils, billions and billions of fossils. None of them talk. None of them have a date stamped on them. We are putting our interpretation on those fossils. So there is no fossil record. There are fossils. You got brainwashed again, okay? They told you that and you believed it. You should have, you should have checked it out. There's no fossil record. We find fossils all the time. Here's a fossil clam in the closed position. The only way I think this could possibly happen is it had to be buried alive. As soon as clams open, as soon as they die, they open. So it had to be buried alive. They find petrified clams and find all kinds of creatures on top of Mount Everest. So I think the evidence for the flood is overwhelming. There's no fossil record. No fossil would count as transitional. You couldn't prove that fossil had any children that lived. You sure couldn't prove it had kids that were different than itself. My point remains, no animal today produces animals other than their same kind. You have to imagine that it happened millions of years ago. And you, at the end, mentioned a bunch of branches of science as if that's evidence by calling off the name geology and biology and archaeology. That's, calling off the name doesn't prove it. I've asked for a long time, Donnie, on this program now for a year. Does anybody ever have any observable evidence for evolution? Science is what we can observe, what we can test, what we can demonstrate. Where's the observation? Well, we can't see it, but it took place millions of years ago. Well, that's my point. Even if it's true, it's not science. You're polluting science with your religion of evolution. And I resent that. So take questions from the audience, Donnie. That's enough. Okay, Kent, thank you for that concluding statement. Uh, Fox and Kent, thank you for an interesting discussion. And okay, let's start with, uh, let's see, there's a lot of questions here. So why don't we start with, 
Okay, so this is a question related to argument one and two, kind of a mix of the debate. And so this comes in from Echoing Erudite. Question for Fox. Mm -hmm. EE asks, you mentioned fossil claims at Grand Canyon. What evolutionary progression has happened to any of those fossils in the last five to six million years? That's a good question. So it says, you mentioned fossil clams at Grand Canyon. What evolutionary progress has happened to any of those fossils? Well, um, like I said before, they were in the lake that was formed there. Um, most of them died off during the um, during um, when the lake was drained, um, forming the Grand Canyon. So I think most of them died off. Um, if any of them were alive, they probably adapted to the change in climate. But um, definitely, uh, most of them died from, you know, the lake definitely draining out. And that's how we are able to see the fossils that are there um, of these different clams and, you know, um, different um, mollusks. Okay. Appreciate the response. Kent, over to you. As far as anybody's ever observed in all of human history, all over the world, clams make baby clams. I'd be willing to bet five bucks that those clams they found in Grand Canyon, if they have any descendants at all, are still clams. That's all we've ever seen. That would be science. As far as the five million years ago, that's baloney, but I'll give you five million years. They're still clams. How did they know they were clams? Because they look like clams today. Duh. Go ahead. Okay, thank you, Kent. Fox, the question was for you. And so typically on this channel, what we do in order to move along smoothly and fairly, we'll give, uh, you get the last word since it was your question. Okay. Yeah, I mean, um, I don't know exactly um, what changes took place because um, I haven't really studied um, the different fossils that are in that area. Um, they could have just, you know, they probably still were, you know, shellfish after at the end of the day they probably really did not have enough time to evolve in five million years and even if they did they probably just had adaptations for the changing environment but the fact that the grand canyon you know was rapidly eroding from the lake most of them went extinct um if they if there were some that survived um they probably did not have that much time to you know change and um, have new features and create new species from that common ancestor. I don't think that's a really enough time for them to really change much. They probably went mostly unchanged. Okay, thank you there, Fox. Next question comes in from Urz Alir. Question for Kent. Is there a concrete analog for kind, so I guess the word kind, created kind, in current scientific nomenclature well nomenclature is the way we name things man has decided to call things different things uh give different names and assign a classification system as far as what is a species or kind i showed this earlier uh let's see even the textbook got google species it will come up species in biology a group of organisms consisting of similar individuals and then it says type Kind, sort, genus, family, order, breed, race. There's a lot of different names, nomenclature, names that are used to determine. Is a dog and a wolf the same kind of animal? Yeah. Is a dog and a banana the same kind of life form? No. I think a four-year-old can tell you if they're the same kind. Now, man has decided to split hairs over this and decide there's now two species of mosquitoes. The mosquitoes don't care, okay? There are 14 varieties of finches on the Galapagos Islands. The finches don't care. They don't, even, they don't even think about it. So a concrete analog for kind. I'm not obligated to um, prove that the biblical class, the Bible says they bring forth after their kind. Okay, But see, I'm not demanding the Bible be taught in schools at taxpayer expense. You guys are demanding that your religion of evolution be taught at everybody's expense. It's burden of proofs on you to prove they can become a different kind. 24 times in seven chapters, my Bible says, they bring forth after their kind, after their kind, after their kind, after their sort. 
What evidence do you have that would say that's not true? Not going back to a fossil, you can't prove that any kids. I mean, today, a lot of animals alive today, a lot of animals having babies today. Where's it happening? That would be science, things we can observe. We can't observe it, therefore it's not science. Evolution is nothing but a religion and a really dumb one. Go ahead. Thank you, Kent. Fox, over to you. All right. Yeah, um, there definitely are synonyms for species, but scientists still use species as the common term. Um, kind, type, those are synonyms. Um, so they're synonymous. But in science, we like to use the more complicated words and the, all the Latin roots of animals. Like It's just like an animal, you know? We have the common name and then we have the Latin name. And in science, we tend to use the Latin name. So um, species does have synonyms, like kind is a synonym and type is a synonym. But we usually use species because that is widely used by everybody across the world. We use species. Okay, Kent, question was for you. Get the last word. No, nothing else to add. Go ahead. Okay, thank you. Next question comes in from Taylor K. Thank you for the question. Taylor's got a question for Fox. Where does this new information come from that enables these new species to adapt? Mutations. Um, mutations within the uh, genes. So um, it, it happens over a very long period of time, but the um, mutations cause new things to come up. Um, so yeah, over time, um, the genome changes. Um, whatever that, whatever the environment causes the animal to react to, over time, the animal will adapt that mu mutation to survive to their environment over a very long period of time. So yeah, mutations cause that. Okay, thank you, uh, Fox. Kent, over to you. Well, that was another classic example of his SpongeBob imagination. We don't see any mutations that add information at all. We see mutations that are de destructive or neutral or useless, but we don't see a beneficial mutation. Certainly not a mutation that adds information. You can imagine it and you can claim it happened over time. You're way outside of science, way outside. You're in a religion, clearly a religion. Go ahead. Okay, thank you, Kent. And Fox, you get the last word. All right. Yeah. Um, so there's different, there's beneficial mutations and there are negative, um, you know, mutations. Um, usually when, you know, an organism adapts, they have either a mutation that is positive for them, or sometimes animals have mutations that don't really benefit them. Um, and then sometimes it's kind of in the middle where they have a mutation that doesn't really do anything really. That's just there because it's kind of like, you know, residual from the past. Um, so, I mean, it's just kind of like humans. We have leftover organs today that we don't really need that are not really beneficial to us, but we have evolved a larger and more complex brain over time. Um, and actually our brains are starting to get smaller because um, they're becoming better for processing. Um, and over time, we're just going to continue to have more complex thinking and more complex brains. Yeah, just over time, um, you know, mutations will change to either help the animal or sometimes it doesn't help the animal. Sometimes they just have kind of like junk DNA um, that doesn't really help them that much, but they have usually both. Okay, Fox, thank you very much. Uh, next question comes in for Kent, Jeremy Nolan. Not 100% on topic, but Ken, if, if you want to answer it, feel free to do so. So he asks, Ken, do you have any evidence for the earth being 6,000 years old or just young in general besides the Bible? Well, I have a whole videotape on that topic, the age of the earth, my creation seminar part one. Just Google Kent Hoven creation seminar part one. There are lots of scientific evidences. If you look at <clears throat> the fact that <clears throat> we only have recorded history, going back, you know, 4,000, 5,000 years. Actual proof of recorded human history, only a few thousand years worth. I cover on my video number one, all kinds of uh, scientific evidences that the earth cannot be billions of years old. 
for instance, it would take a long time to call all this up here. The Earth is spinning. I think everybody would agree with that. But the Earth is slowing down. The Earth is slowing down at about a thousandth of a second per day. That's why every year and a half, they have to add a second to the clock. Google leap second. This may be complicated for some going to universities being brainwashed, but if the Earth is slowing down, that means it used to be going faster. How far back in time can you go before that would create a problem? You can't go back billions of years. The Earth was spinning too fast. No life could exist here. The Coriolis effect would make tides and uh, ocean currents and wind currents that were phenomenal. Uh, the sun is burning up its fuel, 5 million tons every second. That means it used to be heavier if you go back in time. The sun is losing about 5 feet an hour. Now, I know it oscillates, but it generally the overall trend is toward contraction. Ever since they've been able to measure the sun with trigonometry, they said, wow, the sun is shrinking 5 feet an hour. Okay, that means it used to be bigger. That would put a time limit and take away your billions of years. The oldest tree in the world, 40, less than 4,500 years old. Why don't we have one 10 million years old? Uh, Niagara Falls is eroding back. The human population clearly shows man has not been here for billions of years. They could easily get eight, all the people today from eight people getting off of Noah's Ark. So again, it's not my duty to prove the Bible is true. I'm not asking that it be taught. I'm sorry, demanding that it be taught. Uh, <clears throat> it's a burden of proofs on you guys. I know you guys need billions of years for your theory to look good. You've referred to it 40 times tonight. Well, go back in time, millions of years ago. We'll go back. Somebody else can go back and count how many times you referred to it. Time is the god of the evolutionist. And if millions of years don't work, add billions of years. But you add more time, and the recipe will turn out fine. It's pure imagination. Real silly, in my humble opinion. Go ahead. Thank you very much for that response there, Kent. And uh, Fox, over to you if there's anything you'd like to add. Yeah, um, I would just say that um, there's definitely no evidence for the Earth being 6,000 years old other than uh, the Bible. I don't even think really the Bible illicitly states that it was 6,000 years old. Um, that's different people's interpretations of what the Bible says. People like to cherry pick what they want it to say and what it doesn't say. So every Christian is going to have their own opinion of what it says. I think the Bible is irrelevant anyways. Um the Earth is about four point. Um, let me look it up again. I think it was four point five billion years old, um, and the Sun is pretty close. Yeah, um, the Earth is very old. Um, there's old human civilizations that are much older than six thousand years old. Just look at the pyramids. They're starting to date them older and older. The more they find out about Egyptology, um, there's ancient sites like Stonehenge. Puma Punku. Um, I mean, I could go on and on, but there's, um, what's it called? Um, there's, um, what's that one um, site? I can't remember what it's called, um, but it was dated to be older than 12,000 years old. Um, I'm trying to remember what it's called right now. I can't remember. But there's many human civilizations that predate 6,000 years old and debunk that completely. Um, not also, I mean, not to mention that the old the Earth is much older than that. The Sun is much older than that. Um, the entire universe is 13.7 billion years old. So everything that we have pretty much debunks that. Okay, Kent, we'll give you the last word if you'd like it. Question was for you. Well, again, all he gave is dogma. Uh, you can believe that if you wish. Uh, you don't have civilizations. You can date older than that with any scientific way to date things. <clears throat> You can say, you can make a claim, well, this civilization is 12,000 years old or 10 billion years old, but that's, I'd like to see how that's scientifically proven, okay? Oh, there we go. Show me your phone. I can read that real good while you wave it around. Uh, so, no, the scientific evidence, but again, we're off, off topic here. He's supposed to be presenting evidence for evolution. I haven't heard any except, well, it happened, dogma. I, where's the evidence for the evolution? They always try to divert it and put the burden of proof on us to prove creation. That, that's uh, a common tactic that crooked lawyers use, shift the burden of proof. Where's the evidence for evolution? You're demanding we all pay for it to be taught. I'd like to see the evidence. So far, I've seen none other than a claim that it happened, and you're related to a chicken. Okay, Kent, thank you very much. So next question comes in from Centurion7374 Fox. Are the layers laid down vertically or horizontally? 
And what is your evidence to support your position? Oh, let me just unmute you, Fox. Okay, you're good. The entire scientific community um, believes in my position because all evidence points to there being a fossil record and there being layers of, you know, uh, strata over time. Um, and you can clearly see the Grand Canyon is a great example. Um, let me share my screen for you guys. Because, you know, if I keep just waving my hands around, it's not going to do any good for you guys. All right. Let's... I have a couple good pictures on my presentation, actually, for this question. That was not the one. Here it is. Okay. Um, so obviously this is like a cartoon example, but, um, Fox, did you make sure to click the, uh, the oh, share? Let me, did I click the right button? Oh yeah. Sorry. Okay. Ah, uh, you're good. Um, so clearly let me, um, see if I can go into the present part view slideshow from the beginning. Okay. Here we go. So, um, yeah, it's usually horizontally. Um, this is obviously like a cartoon example. But when you go into different areas of the world, you can see when you are digging up the earth that all the different fossils are going to be in different layers of uh, the rock. Um, some are going to be dated to be older than some other ones. Um, each is going to be around a different period. The ones to the top are going to be newer, and the ones to the bottom are going to be older. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it, it goes back to the geological time scale and radiometric dating and radiocarbon dating. Um, I'm not going to get too much into that. But, yeah, um, clearly there are layers that we can observe with our own eyes, Kent, um, that prove that there are different time eras where there were older animals and then newer animals to the top. Okay, thank you, uh, Fox. I appreciate it. Um, we got a lot. We got a very lively chat in terms of the side chat right now. Lots of comments and questions coming through. But I am going to uh, start wrapping it up here. We could be doing these all night. So yeah. I want to appreciate the debaters' time. So I don't Kent, have all night. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, okay, uh, Kent. If there's anything you'd like to add, uh, go ahead. I gr I agree. There are layers. I agree. We can see them with our own eyes. I do not agree that they're different ages. That time chart that you showed, I've got the same thing I use in my presentation, says the Holocene era at the top is 10,000 years old. Where was it sitting? It says the bottom layer is 2.5 billion years old. Look at your chart. That's what it says. Where was the Holocene era? Where was that material sitting around for 2.499 billion years? Where was it? Outer space? You claim the layers are different ages. This is pure baloney. If I flip this thing over, I can form multiple layers in minutes, this little sand art toy. Is the top layer younger? Is the bottom layer older? No, they're all in the glass at the same time. Every speck of dirt on the planet is the same age. All of it. There is no geologic column. And the layers, the question was, did the layers form horizontally or vertically? They form horizontally. If the moon is lifting the tide up and pushing it back down or letting it back down, as the tide goes up and down, the water has to come in and out of the tidal surge, tidal bump. Layers form vertically or form uh, horizontally as the water's moving. A fossil could be found on top that's actually older than a fossil at the bottom. The geologic column does not exist. Animals are sorted a little bit. Birds are generally found at the top because sorted based on habitat or based on intelligence or based on body density or mobility. Clams are found at the bottom. Clams are already at the bottom when the flood starts. That's where they live. Of course, they're the first ones buried. All these layers that we can see with our own eyes are oftentimes twisted and contorted and bent while they were all soft at the same time. There are no internal fracture marks. If the layers are different ages, why wouldn't we see the if, if that one layer was hard before the next one was laid down, they would crack and fracture. I'm sorry, you've really been thoroughly brainwashed. The geologic column does not exist. The fossil record does not exist. All the layers formed at the same time. 
polystrata fossils prove that, trees petrified running through them all. There's been no change of any animal or plant throughout observed human history. Nobody sees it. Every farmer in the world counts on evolution not happening. They crossbreed their cows, they expect a cow. That's what they got so far. So evolution is pure imagination, SpongeBob style. You think you came from a sponge? I, I'm beginning to believe you. Go ahead. Okay, thank you, Kent. Fox, if I remember correctly, the question was for you. So have a quick final mm -hmm. word. Yeah, I mean, obviously you guys can see that it was formed horizontally. I don't disagree with that. Um, but clearly um, there is older organisms um, at the bottom and newer at the top because they all lived at di different time periods. If, we, if they all lived at the same time, they would be in one layer, just one gigantic layer. There would not, there would be no need for different layers. Why would there be different layers? Um, you know, if they were all lived at the same time, like Kent believes, like all the dinosaurs and everything, um, and humans and everything that has lived throughout Earth's history, we would find fossils of humans next to dinosaurs and all in the same place, you know, one giant layer. But that's not the case. The case is that we have many different layers that have different animals that evolved over time. So it's pretty clear that um, we wouldn't even need all these time periods if we all, you know, lived at the same time. Do we have dinosaurs roaming around outside? No, because they're extinct. Um, there are, you know, many different time eras. Okay, thank you. What we're going to do now is one final question. Got to make sure I get these uh, super chats in. And here it is. So final question for the night, Kent and Fox. Again, thank you so much for the time you have, you have given me and the audience. We've got a great audience tonight for this. Very thorough debate. Lots of good topics discussed. So Armored Bear 365 thank you so much for the uh, super chat and support. Question for Fox. How do mutations prove evolution is true? And why do you say that you have the whole scientific community? Where's the evidence? That's definitely the consensus um, that everybody believes that mutations drive um, evolution. It's a part of adaptations. Um, it's just a basic part of science. In fact, here, I'm going to share my screen with you guys so I can respond to that. Okay, did it, did it, yeah, it's screen shared, cool, okay. I'm going to bring up the definition of mutations first for you guys. Um, it's the action or process of mutating the change of the structure of a gene, resulting in a variant form that may be transmitted to subsequent generations caused by the alteration of single base units in DNA or the deletion, insertion, or re arrangement of larger sections of genes or chromosomes. Um, any change in the DNA sequence of a cell is a mutation. Mutations may be caused by mistakes, mistakes during cell division, or they may be caused by exposure to DNA damaging um, agents in the environment. So when the environment changes, the, you know, mutations change. They have to adapt and the genes have to change to the changing environment. So that's why we have mutations created. The mutations react to the environment. So there's a good answer for you guys. Okay, thank you uh, for the response. Kent, over to you if there's anything you'd like to add. Yeah, can you put the question back up? There you go, okay. Yes. yes. Uh, I'd like to see a beneficial mutation. They talk about them. Mutations are harmful, fatal, or neutral. Uh, if there was a good beneficial mutation, you'd have to have two at the same time of the opposite sex in the same place for it to work. And then those two that have this beneficial mutation have to somehow swamp the whole rest of the world's population. This has to happen trillions and trillions of times to change an amoeba to a whale or a human. It just isn't science. I wish you could understand. It's nothing but imagination. So why do you say you have the whole scientific community? Because you don't. You're lying or you're confused. You don't have the whole scientific community on your side. There are thousands and thousands of scientists who do not believe in evolution thousands of creation scientists. What does it take to become a scientist anyway? If your definition of scientist excludes creationists, well, then of course you're going to win, okay? But science is what we know, what we study, what we observe. Who decides who's a scientist anyway? Uh, 
I think you're, you're completely wrong. It may be that a large number of sci people in the scientific research field believe in evolution. That might be. But that's what they believe in. That's not that's just, they might, they might drive blue cars too. What does that prove? Nothing, okay? The fact that they all drive cars doesn't prove anything. So the fact that a bunch of people believe something doesn't make it true. 55 million Germans believed Hitler was a great guy and followed him. 110 million people believe Stalin was a great guy and followed Stalin in World War II. People have made dumb mistakes and followed dumb people for a long time, and now they're following an extremely dumb one named Charles Darwin. You've been lied to, I'm sorry. Okay, There are no beneficial mutations that you can prove. You can imagine that they happen, but it, it isn't science. They draw these family trees and say, oh, yeah, you're related to a pine tree. Yep. No, I'm sorry, you're related to a chicken. It's claiming that a protozoa turned to a biology teacher is not science. It's a religious belief. Somebody drew lines connecting them on paper. I bet I could draw a line connecting the Empire State Building to a chicken. I bet I could, I bet I could get a picture of both and draw a line in PowerPoint in probably a minute. It doesn't prove anything. All these are is imagination, lines on paper. So the question was, how do mutations prove evolution is true? They don't. It would take trillions of them, and we don't see any. What do you have to say about the whole scientific community? He shouldn't. He shouldn't be saying that. I'm sorry, he, she, whatever you are, should not be saying the whole scientific community because it's not true. Where's the evidence? There's none. There's no evidence for evolution at all. I stand my ground. Go ahead. Okay, thanks for the response, Kent. Fox, the question was for you. It is the final question of the night. You can have the last word. So, uh, Armored Bear, um, I just want to let you know that uh, they do prove evolution is true. Um, also, Kent brought up an analogy um, with Germans, you know, following Hitler as to, like, scientists following evolution. That is messed up, number one. We shouldn't be bringing up the Holocaust, number two. Um, the whole scientific community... You know, it's not going to agree on everything, but the majority of the scientific community does favor evolution, and the evidence favors evolution. It wouldn't be a theory if it hasn't passed the highest level of scrutiny. It would still just be a hypothesis, or it would have been just dismissed if it had no evidence to back it up. If evolution had no evidence to back it up, it would not be being taught in schools. It would not be the main, you know, um, source for everything. Um, then you know, the Bible would be the source for everything. If the Bible was really true and God created everything and that was scientifically backed, then that would be different. But that's not the case. Okay, Fox official, thank you for the final word. That wraps up the Q&A. To the audience, thank you so much for all your feedback, input, and questions that you have sent for tonight's debate on evolution on trial. Let's get some final thoughts, final words from the debaters Fox official, thanks for doing this. Let's start with you. Uh, some quick final thoughts, final words. Yeah, um, I I always have fun doing debates. Um, I like to see everybody's different perspectives. Um, there's so many different perspectives. The world is so um, huge. Um, there's so many people that believe in different things. Um, evolution is true, and it has evidence backing it up. It's not a religion. Um, Christianity is a religion, Buddhism is a religion, um, things that you have magical thinking um, is a religion. So anything like magic with Dr. Strange is a religion where you have to put faith into something in order to believe that it exists without actually observing it. Science, like you said, Kent, science is observation. We don't obser observe a God. We don't see evidence of a God. There is no evidence of any God or gods. Uh, you can believe whatever you want to believe, you know, that's okay. It's a free nation. You know, it's a free world. People can believe whatever they want to believe. They could believe they were reincarnated. They could believe they, you know, um, only live for a short period of time and then they die forever. I mean, you could believe whatever you want, you know, um, it doesn't matter. So, you know, I think the world's an amazing place. There's people with different perspectives that believe different things. And I think that's awesome. If we all thought the same thing, you know, we would all be robots in the world. So I think it's really awesome that people believe different things and have their own perspectives. It makes us individuals. Well, thank you, uh, Fox Official, for those final words, final thoughts. And again, thanks for uh, joining us for a debate on this important topic. Uh, Kent, we'll hand it over to you now. Uh, again, to you, thanks for doing all of these debates on evolution. And some final words, final thoughts. 
Well, again, I've heard nothing but dogma. He just claims evolution's true. Everybody believes it. And he, he's obviously been brainwashed to believing that statement is true. Uh, I'm sure I'm sorry, he, she, whatever you are. Uh, so I think that it's, uh, it's a sad indicator of what's happened with our educational system. People are paying money to have kids taught this stuff. It's sad. I would go with Pascal's wager. If I'm right and there's a God and you're wrong, you're in trouble. If you're right and there's no God, I don't lose a thing. I've had a wonderful life. I might have been delusional, brainwashed, but hey, it's been great. You might be delusional and brainwashed too. You got everything to lose. I don't have anything to lose. Pascal said, that's a good wager there. Yep. If you can't marvel at the amazing design we see around us, you really think this happened by chance. There was no designer. Nobody made this. Beam me up, Scotty. There's no intelligent life down here. If you can look at the creatures or the, in, you're studying entomology for heaven's sake. You can really study these insects and think they happened by chance. Nobody designed it. How on earth can you believe such a dumb thing? I'm, I feel sad for you. Okay, that's it. Go ahead. Okay, Kent, thank you for those final words, final thoughts to the debaters again. Uh, excellent debate. I appreciate the cordial discussion, easy to moderate. And to the audience, thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, tuning in, please share these debates around. These, these debates and critical thinking, it's important. And real quick, uh, last minute notification, we'll be back here in two days. This one's going to be earlier, though. Three o'clock Central, four o'clock EST, Kent and Christian Dean. So with that, uh, God bless. Standing for Truth is out.